Sam, can you comment on the Senator Elizabeth Warren proposed legislation, and then I'll let uh, Preston take lead on the FinCEN rule changes, because I know that he's done a lot of thinking and writing about that stuff. Well, it basically, I feel like it's an attack on, quote unquote, unhosted wallets or the ability of people to self-custody because it makes them, it basically requires them to report information that they a, probably can't even comply with. And it treats them like financial institutions. Anybody who's running a node or relays, quote unquote, blockchain information has to act like a financial institution and comply with reporting requirements in like AML, KYC. And um, it's just an attack on permissionless blockchain infrastructure and trying to make it unavailable to Americans. It's trying to siphon any kind of uh, decentralization in terms of the ability to run a node to self-custody and trying to siphon it into basically custody arrangement with regula regulated entities that report uh, identifying information on all the users. And so it's really an extension of the Bank Secrecy Act, which you know I find unconstitutional. I think it's an infringement um, on our privacy, which is um, protected by the Fourth Amendment, but also it's just a fundamental human right, uh, privacy. It's, it's your ability to live with dignity and, and not feel like there's a big brother watching over your shoulder. It's actually fundamental to democracy to be able to have private conversations that go against, uh, you know, the consensus of, of the of the government. And it allows us to kind of formulate ideas and push forward. And so it's an attack on privacy when it really comes down to it. And it, it's an attack on property rights. And so that's why I'm very, very against this Warren bill. And I think, you know, Bitcoiners are really loud about it, but I think it actually extends out further. And there should be more of an uproar about this from communities or any, anybody who, who wants financial privacy. And we've just seen pri privacy just continue to get eroded over the last couple of decades. And it's just getting into a kind of a nonsensical state right now where they just continue to want more and more privacy in the name of security. But there's a, there's a pendulum there. And I think that pendulum has to swing back. And, um, you know, I think Preston wrote a great piece about the FinCEN rules, which is a little bit differently, but, but like there has to be a movement here and advo advocate for privacy when it comes down to it, because that's kind of the underlying core issue here. Americans haven't shown much, you know, historically much concern about losing privacy in the name of security. Uh, I mean, just let's take a look at the Patriot Act. percent Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the best example, right? And then all of all of the the fallout from the Patriot Act where Americans mostly unknowingly, I'm sure, are giving up uh, tons of, of uh, privacy rights. And it led to the mass surveillance of, of the American, you know, every American citizen. And that's been documented thanks to Snowden. So do you have any faith that Americans will actually rally into a movement to defend their privacy? Yeah, you know, it's kind of hard to tell because you're right. Like there, it's this ongoing battle between privacy and security that's really been going on really it's it's since the cypherpunks. I mean, and, and in the digital age, it's encryption that allows for privacy. And so you have this battle against encryption and Bitcoin is just that next step in that battle or that war against privacy in the digital age. And Americans have to start caring because we could live in this world that I don't think anybody really wants to live in, which is this surveillance state that we talk about. And maybe we're already in it. Uh, but Bitcoin represents kind of a change in the path um, where encryption is brought back into our lives and there's some some kind of amount of uh, anonymity to our transactions where they can't see every single thing that we're going to do all the time and attach identifying information to it. Um, and so I think building tools that, increased privacy on Bitcoin should be at the forefront of what people are building today, because I think it's that important. Um, but you're right. You know, when, when you look at history, you know, lot, not a lot of people care about it, but I think that's about, it's about building technologies that can re like fight against it, that they can't stop. That's going to be ultimately what matters. You know, I'm reminded of Lynn Alden's quote from her book, Broken Money, which she said, you know, politics can affect things locally and temporarily, but technology can affect things globally and permanently. And so I just, I, I think there could be a fight now on the political level, and maybe we might lose that battle. But if we build technologies that overcome it, 
that could be a permanent change yep. and kind of, uh, you know, reset this course that we're on towards a surveillance state. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. We have an alternative and the alternative is not going away. So even if we can't build a movement in time to stop something like a CBDC in this country, the the best way to advocate maybe for Bitcoin will be to have the CBDC enacted and let's you know show through you know the reality of the situation to Americans the consequences the privacy consequences of a CBDC and then people move over to Bitcoin a lot of times people need to experience the consequences in order to understand them uh, Preston let's talk a, a minute about the FinCEN uh, regulations or the proposed rule changes can you summarize those and what do you think their potential to be enacted are and what the fallout might be uh, in the coming years if the rules are changed? Before I do that, I just want to make one comment on that last yes. uh, part that you guys were saying. I think one of the, the big benefits that the United States does have is how powerful state rights are. Um, and if there's any saving grace or hope here in the United States, it's kind of the fact that you have all these different uh, states that are able to uh, create laws to help protect uh, sovereignty rights for ownership of Bitcoin versus a central bank digital currency. And I think that that's a massive battle that would take place between states and the federal government, which uh, when, you, when you're trying to defeat this and maybe stand up a CBDC in its place, which you know that's a whole very, very long conversation that I, almost is an eye roll to me because <laughs> I don't think that they have a chance. Um, the time, the speed at which you can implement something like that and gain control of, of the narrative and the money is of the essence. And that battle that would take place between states and federal government here in the U.S. is, is one of the reasons why I'm so bullish for Bitcoin and I don't think the CBDC stands a chance. Um, on the FinCEN side, so a little bit of background. So this is back in, oh, when was it? Was, it, was this early uh december or maybe even november it might have been november yeah it was november it was november um so elizabeth warren comes out and is just throwing all of this wall street journal report around that uh hamas was being funded by crypto and uh the whole bit right she sends a letter off to the president uh, quoting this Wall Street Journal article, which was a total hack job where they said that it was, you know, over a hundred million dollars that was funneled through crypto. In, in the reality, the chain analysis uh, showed that it was like three or four hundred thousand dollars, which was less than a percent of what they were claiming in the Wall Street Journal. Wall Street Journal had to go back and uh, clarify that they were wrong in the article, but this was all noise uh, weeks later after like her attempt or the messaging campaign that she was working went out the next day after she sent this message to the president FinCEN, which falls under the president's cabinet, uh, came out with this proposed, uh, policy of this sweeping regulation against crypto. And, and when I say sweeping, I mean, it's just take as much, uh, garbage that you could possibly collect throw it against the wall and just let's see what the heck sticks was was how i would describe this fincen proposal when you actually read it and let me tell you i've read it and i've gone through it aggressively <laughs> it is um so overwhelming the amount of legal speak and uh laws referenced and this is all uh you know, you, you can go look it up. Um, the easiest way to find my response for this is just uh, type in ego death capital or ego death in FinCEN. And it'll be it should be the first thing that comes up on Google. Um, and you'll see the, the response that I put out there. And I went line by line through all this. FinCEN had, uh, oh boy, uh, I want to say like 30 questions, 34 questions maybe that I responded to um, of... So when, when they put this proposal out into the public, they list questions along with the proposal that the public can respond to. The purpose of this uh, response with the public is, hey, we're getting ready to make a bunch of changes to the law. This is your chance, public, to tell us your concerns or where we might be missing something so that we can make it as effective as possible um, in, a, in a legal framework. 
And then after that comment period ends, which I think it ends on the 22nd of January. So it's still open, still open for comments. And I would highly, highly encourage people to read, copy, plagiarize, whatever I've, uh, you know, just pull a president gay uh, and uh, just, you know, copy everything that I put here and post it into the comments. Um, the Harvard uh, president that just stepped down. Um, <laughs> go uh, look at this and take what all the research that I conducted. This took me like three work, three weeks to put together. Um, but the main things that I found as I went through the proposal is that it aggressively violated um, a couple core things in our constitution. First of all, it's unreasonable searches and seizures. Uh, this was, you know, the first thing that I addressed. I go through all the case on all of these points. I have case law that backs up why it's breaching our constitutional rights. The next one was the freedom of speech and association. Then I talk about the right to financial privacy. Um, I talk about the due process and rights being violated in the constitution. Uh, the right to secure uh, in personal information, personal information and data uh, is drastically violated. Uh, the right to non-discrimination is violated in the Constitution, and then the access to financial services is violated. Um, tons of data and information and case law to back up all of that. So go into that document, copy and paste it, put put the content. Here's why you do this. So they're gonna they're gonna pass this thing. Okay, they will pass this proposal. And what happens after they pass it is now it's on the burden of anybody in this space, any industry, this whole industry to go and fight legally why their rights were breached. Okay. You're not going to stop them from, from, you know, pushing this through. They're going to push it through. Um, but what we can do from a legal standpoint for all these companies, you know, if, if you're a business in this space, um, what you can do when you do go to court after it's been passed is you can say, look back here in the public register. There was a thousand comments about how this is illegal and this is violating our rights. And yet the FinCEN went and passed it, Right. And let me tell you, I, I've talked to Joe Carlosari and some other legal experts. I was like, does that actually help you as you're litigating this on the back end? And they're like, absolutely, it's huge. Okay, so that's that's what you're really doing. You're not going to stop it from happening. But on the other side, when it does show up in the courts, everybody can kind of point to all these key points that we're making and highlighting through case law of how they're just um just overtly like stealing your freedom and your rights. Like, <laughs> like it's really bad. So mm -hmm. the, I guess the whole point of all of that, take action, go read the document. Uh, you don't have to, I mean, it's very long, it's very thorough, but you can go in there, pull whatever pieces you're passionate about, just post it in, you know, it's really, I have links straight to the FinCEN comment section. You can click it, you put your email address in, you paste your comment in and just hit submit. Um, after I published this FinCEN, I don't know if, how much of an impact I had versus what people were naturally doing, but we had hundreds, hundreds of comments that were posted into the, into the register after this went out. So, uh, please, please take action and just, you know, take three minutes of your time, five minutes of your time to, to post something.